We'll be entering the courtroom soon. Come to order. You may be seated. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cooper, carry on. I appreciate uh, the court's indulgence. For oh, well, that is a good idea. <laughs> uh, Your Honor, I, I do. I hope I've sharpened uh, my th thoughts a little bit here as, as, uh, as my closing argument uh, comes to a close. Um, I want to address a, an issue that the court took up with Mr. Olson, and that is the, the question whether or not this case would have been different if the California Supreme Court had, had not rendered its ruling uh, when it did, and, uh, and, uh, uh, or maybe even stayed the application of its ruling in anticipation of uh, the people's judgment in Proposition 8, as it was asked to do, and as, uh, as some other uh, state Supreme Courts have done in a cer similar circumstance. Uh, this is uh, something on which I agree with uh, Mr. Olson, uh, if I understood his, uh, his, his answer correctly. I, I don't believe that that uh, would make a difference. I don't believe that the fact that the uh, California Supreme Court uh, rendered its ruling, and then it was effectively overturned by the vote of the people uh, should make a difference either in the, in the analysis of this case. Um, I th the court, I think, asked uh, Mr. Olson, what kind of regime would we have if, if, the, uh, if the constitutionality of uh, California law uh, prescribing the traditional uh, definition of marriage uh, would, would, uh, be, would, would turn on whether or not the issue came to a federal court before or after the uh, state court had decided the issue. The, uh, uh, and Your Honor, the, uh, the United States Supreme Court has addressed precisely that uh, circumstance in a case called Crawford against Board of Education. I want to, to share a, uh, uh, a passage from that case. It was from 1982 and upheld, it upheld a California constitutional amendment that reduced the remedial tools that were available to state courts in the school desegregation uh, area. Uh, it, it cut back on those remedial tools. And in that case, the court stated as follows. We reject the contention that once a state chooses to do more than the 14th Amendment requires, it may never recede. We reject an interpretation of the 14th Amendment so destructive of a state's democratic processes and of its ability to experiment. This interpretation has no support in the decisions of this court. And, Your Honor, uh, the court went on, uh, and it was as though I would submit to you it had this case in mind when it further said, we would not interpret the 14th Amendment to require the people of a state to adhere to a judicial construction of their state constitution when that constitution itself vests final authority in the people. In short, having gone beyond the requirements of the federal constitution, the state was free to return in part to the standard prevailing generally throughout the United States. Uh, Your Honor, one, one of the points that the Crawford Court what, makes, yes. What do we make of that in this uh, context, in this case? That the, um, essentially the California Supreme Court's interpretation, which we would submit goes beyond the 14th Amendment, was something that the people of the state were were empowered essentially to reverse. And that is especially true. I see, okay. That's especially true 
given the fact in California, and Crawford came from the state of California, this, the, the people of the state reserve into their own hands as essentially the ultimate appellate tribunal in this state, the authority to rev review the decisions effectively of the California Supreme Court. So in a very real sense, the California Supreme Court's decision, particularly given that Proposition 8 was then effectively pending before the people, the California Supreme Court's decision was in that context no more final in the state of California than the California Court of Appeals decision was before that, which had upheld Proposition 8 by a closely divided uh, uh, court. Uh, it was reviewed by the ultimate judicial tribunal in this, in this state, and the, and the, and the judgment uh, of the Supreme Court in the Crawford case, it, it, it seems to me, is on, is on the point here. You know, I want to address, I think, finally here, a, the issue um, of whether or not there's a legitimate basis to, for people of this state or anyone to be concerned that uh, redefining uh, marriage, uh, redefining the traditional understanding of marriage to include same-sex couples presents any basis for concern about the harm to marriage that may result and to the interests that the institution of marriage has historically <clears throat> been designed to advance. <clears throat> Many people believe, uh, Your Honor, that that harm will, uh, that, that, that such harm is threatened. Um, but before analyzing this, I think we have to begin with two propositions. The first one is that redefining the institution will change the institution. Uh, I think Mr. Blankenhorn uh, really s summed it up quite well. If you change the definition of a thing, it's hard to imagine how it could have no impact on the thing itself. The plaintiff's experts uh, acknowledged, uh, excuse me, the plaintiff's uh, expert and others uh, who have thought and are expert in this field have acknowledged that change will result. Um, indeed, when same-sex marriage was legalized in Massachusetts, Professor Cott commented, one could point to earlier watersheds, but perhaps none quite so explicit as this particular turning point. Uh, Professor William Eskridge of Yale Law School and a leading advocate for same-sex marriage has said that enlarging the concept of marriage to embrace same-sex couples would necessarily transform it into something new. Joseph Raz, who's a professor at both Oxford University and Columbia Law School and a same-sex marriage advocate, stated this, there can be no doubt that the recognition of gay marriage will affect as great a transformation in the nature of marriage as that from polygamous to monogamous or from arranged to unarranged marriage. Uh, same-sex marriage activist E.J. Graff of the Brandeis University wrote, if same-sex marriage becomes legal, that venerable institution will ever after stand for sexual choice, for cutting the link between sex and diapers. And that really goes to the heart of, of uh, the concern of many people, that redefining it will, uh, will uh, effectively uh, divorce m the institution of marriage from its historic core procreative uh, purposes. But the second point, Your Honor, in addition to that, that redefining it would inevitably change it, is that it is not possible to predict with certainty uh, and confidence what that change will beget. It seems simply undeniable that a change that is as profound as this one, I would submit undeniably would be, would have some consequences. But it is, it, it, and the plaintiffs think that 
the consequences dominantly will be good consequences. And again, we respect that point of view, but, the, uh, but uh, it's not something that uh, they can possibly prove. And their own expert agrees. Professor Cott, again, the, said this, the consequences of same-sex marriage are impossible to know because no one predicts the future that accurately. Andrew Cherlin, who's a sociologist at John Hopkins and a supporter of same-sex marriage, has written, and he, you'll remember his name from the trial, I'm sure he was the subject of a, a lot of discussion when Mr. Blankenhorn was on the stand. He's written that predicting the future of marriage is risky business. Uh, and he remarked about the unimpressive record of social science researchers in predicting cultural phenomena. He says often, and perhaps even most of the time they get it right, but sometimes they're spectacularly wrong. As he said, for example, in the 1930s, every demographic expert in the United States, every demographic expert, confidently predicted a continuation of low birth rates of the Depression. No one forecast the baby boom that overtook them after World War I. Similarly, not a single 1950s or 1960s sociologist predicted the rise of cohabitation. Two extraordinary uh, 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 sociological phenomena, in your honor, that no one had a clue was coming. Um, in, in this circumstance, we, we, and we would submit to you, and, and I, I, would, I would add this, because I have heard this and read this more than any three things three words that I've ever spoken. I don't know. I don't know how many times, Your Honor. Uh, I had wished I could have those words back. <laughs> well, Because, Your Honor, whatever your question part. is, is I damn sure know. <laughs> what, whatever it is. Well, what do, you, what do you make of Mr. Blankenhorn's uh, statement that when same-sex marriage is legalized, that America will be more American, or will be closer to the American idea? That was your own expert. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Yes, he was. And I think Mr. Blankenhorn is giving voice to a sentiment, and, 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 and Mr. Blankenhorn shares that sentiment with many uh, of my friends, uh, for the planets. And I think, I think he shares that sentiment with many of my fellow Americans. But he still believes that the threat of harm to a central and vital social institution, marriage, and to the interests that, that he believes that it serves is too daunting to, to uh, run the risks of, of gratifying what would otherwise, for Mr. Blankenhorn, favor, no doubt, as he has said, that uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the advent of same-sex marriage. And, Your Honor, I believe that, I believe that there are many who uh, went in the polling place with that sentiment. Uh, that's my speculation. That's all it can be. But uh, as, as R Rabbi Michael Lerner has said, a, a, a well-known uh, 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 person and certainly an advocate of same-sex marriage, there are millions of Americans who believe fervently in equal e equality for gays and lesbians, but who draw the line at marriage. Their, their hearts are, as I would submit to you, pure, as pure as defined by the plaintiffs. But they still believe this is profound. This, is, this, this could be profound. It could, it, it, it could portend some social consequences that would not be. Uh, uh, good ones. Um, and, Your Honor, that reality, 
they rallied that I didn't know because no one can know. Professor Cott doesn't know. Blankenhorn agreed. It's impossible to be completely sure about a prediction of future events. No, there's no, and never been anyone who knows what tomorrow will bring. But if there's a legitimate and, and rational basis to be concerned about that, it, is, it couldn't be more rational for the people of California to say, we aren't going to run that risk, however we assess it. There's a risk. And we're going to wait. We want to see what happens in Massachusetts. We want to see what happens right here and, and elsewhere. And, in the, and, and uh, perhaps Mr. Olson and his clients, who's whose sentiments, you know, are powerful, will be able to convince their fellow Californians that in fact they're right and this, is, this, is, this should happen. A disability, a classification has been put on marriage which disables people who wish to marry others of the same sex. In order to disable certain citizens, do you not have to show a correlative benefit to others or to society? I've and the I don't know or the it's we don't know where this is going to lead answer, is that enough to impose upon some citizens a restriction that others do not suffer from. Your Honor, if it is, if there is a, if there is a rational basis for that distinction, yes. I really think that, that really is, ends up being the bottom line on it. If there is no, if, if in, in looking at the whatever society's purposes are for marriage and interests are for regulating and caring about marriage, if, if, if there's no uh, basis on which to draw a distinction between one group and another, then the distinction can't stand. But if there is a distinguishing characteristic that is relevant to one of those purposes, then the distinction can stand. And, and, and so this, so as, you know, as we have been, uh, it's been our position from the beginning, we don't have to prove that including same-sex marriage within the definition or redefining marriage to include same-sex marriage would visit harm upon the institution and the interests that it serves. We, we submit to you that is not something that is our burden, and I think that's what your correlative benefit uh, question goes to. Rather, we only have to prove that including same-sex couples would not serve those interests either at all or not to the same extent. And we believe that uh, you know, the Supreme Court's case, and in particular Johnson against Robeson, is particularly specifically on the point of that and, and says as much essentially in, in, uh, in those terms. Um, Your Honor. Uh, Wrap up. California Court of Appeals uh, in the marriage cases, as I mentioned earlier and as the court well knows, actually upheld uh, the traditional definition of marriage in that case. And one of the, one of the points it, it made, Your Honor, I think really goes to the, to the heart of the matter and certainly to, uh, to the heart of uh, our submission. 
in that it is the proper role of the legislature, not the court, to fashion laws that serve competing public policies. The legislative process involves setting priorities, making difficult decisions, making imperfect decisions, and approaching problems incrementally. That process is what is at work in this state, and it's at work elsewhere in this country. And as, as the court in Glucksburg said, there is a debate about the morals, the practicalities, and the wisdom of this issue that really goes to the nature of our culture. Uh, and the Constitution should allow that debate to go forward among the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Mr. Olson, why don't we just begin at that point that Mr. Cooper left off with, and that is, uh, in a sense, isn't the danger, perhaps not to you and perhaps not to your clients, but the danger to the position that you are taking is not that you're going to lose this case, either here or at the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, but that you might win it. And as in other areas where the Supreme Court has ultimately constitutionalized something that touches upon highly sensitive social issues and taken that issue out of the political realm, that all that has happened is that the forces, the political forces that otherwise have been frustrated have been generated and built up this pressure and have, as in a subject matter that I'm sure you're familiar with, plagued our politics for 30 years. Isn't the same danger here with this issue? I think the case that you're referring to has, a, has to do with abortion. Um, and the cases upon which we, we rely in which the courts have responded to the needs of the civil rights of our citizens have been entirely different cases. They have relied on, as we do, fundamental established constitutional law. Because the argument that Mr. Cooper makes is essentially the same argument that was made to the Loving Court, which, by the way, the Loving Court unanimously decided to strike down 14 or 15 miscegenation statutes. California had been the first 20 years before that. When it got to the Supreme Court in Loving, it became unanimous. And we stand here today thinking, how could that have been? In 1967, that's only 40 years ago, we would not, we would have punished as a felony in the state of Virginia, the president's mother and father if they tried to travel there and be married. The same argument was made to Martin Luther King and to Thurgood Marshall and to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We are talking about fundamental constitutional rights. We're talking about treating people equally. That's not breaking new ground. We're talking about allowing people the same freedom to marry the person that they love as we have the rest of our society. Now, Mr. Cooper's argument is, and I know he'd like to take back these words, and I know why he would like to take back these words. We don't know. We don't have to prove anything. We don't have any evidence. Yet he relies on persons he was reading from articles written by various persons just a few moments ago from this podium who did not come into this courtroom and testify under oath and subject themselves to cross-examination by my colleague, Mr. Boys. Some of them didn't come into court because they had been cross-examined by Mr. Boys in, his depo in their deposition. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have to know, you, ca you can't take away 
the rights of tens of thousands of persons. Those rights were recognized and did exist in California. I submit that they should have existed before the California Supreme Court decision and before Proposition 8. But you can't come in here and say, I don't know, and I don't have to prove anything, and I don't need any evidence except for some people writing in books who won't come into court and subject themselves to the judicial process. You ask a very good question. I was about to start with it. That, that we talked about, um, Mr. Cooper talks about procreation as the fundamental basis for, the, for marriage. Um, and you made the very good point. Well, don't you have to prove that Proposition 8 does something to protect pro procreation, the channeling, what Mr. Cooper calls the channeling function, which is a new term for me today, that the state of California is in the marriage business in order to channel us or those who are unfortunate enough to live in California get to be channeled. Um, <laughs> what he does have to prove, the Romer Court specifically says this, under the lowest standard of review, you have to prove that you have a legitimate interest and that the object, Proposition 8 in this case, advances that legitimate interest. So how does preventing same-sex couples from getting married advance the interest or protect the interest of procreation. They are not a threat. There was not one single bit of evidence that they are a threat to the channeling function if you accept that California has the right to do that in the first place, and I do not. This is an individual constitutional right, and every Supreme Court decision says that it's the right of persons. It's not the right of California to channel those of us who live in California into certain activities or in a certain way. But you do have to do what you do have to say that Proposition 8 somehow protects this thing that's going to happen. Mr. Cooper finished up by saying, well, you have to admit my definition of traditional definition of marriage, which was not the definition in 14 Supreme Court decisions. It wasn't the definition of Dr. Cott. It wasn't the definition of Dr. Peplaw. It, we had expert witnesses that talked about the history of marriage going far back, not, not 30 years, but far back into history, what marriage has always been. The Supreme Court said older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties. That's not something new. It's marriage. It's not sim single-sex marriage or, or interracial marriage or anything like that. But Mr. Cooper says, you have to accept the fact that, first of all, you have to accept my definition. It has to be between a man and a woman. Then... If you have a marriage between a man and a man or a woman and a woman, it will change the marriage. Well, of course it will, because you started by defining the term that you wanted to define. What we're talking about here is allowing individuals who have the same impulses, the same drives, the same desires as the, all of the rest of us to have a relationship in harmony, stability, and to form a, a family and a neighborhood, all of those things that the Supreme Court talked about. And now tell me how it helps the rest of the citizens of California to keep them out of the club. It doesn't. Now, this so-called deinstitutionalization that Mr. Cooper has talked about a lot earlier, not so much today, but he has talked about it, the breakdown of marriage. It turns out that Mr. Blankenhorn talked about that during the trial as well. And I want to just play, I'm just going to do two more short clips from Mr. Blankenhorn, um, Mr. Cooper wanted him to stay as an expert in this case, and we'll accept that, because uh, he turns out to be fairly helpful to us. But he talked, <laughs> he talked about this deinstitutionalization of marriage. And if he can put the right, pull the right switches, here's what he had to say. I, you know, I meant to say, just for our purposes today, you know, heterosexuals, <laughs> you know, did the deinstitutionalizing. I mean, you know, if we go back and look at the trends I've described, it, it's very clear that this was, uh, this was not, uh, deinstitutionalization is not something that just cropped up a few years ago, whenever we began discussing the possibility of extending equal marriage rights to gay and lesbian people, it, would, it, 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 it predates all that. And Dr. Cott pointed out that 
the increase in marriage, uh, de decrease in marriage, the increase in divorce, the increase in cohabitation happened all over the world between 1970 and 1985. One of it was the institution of no-fault divorce. New York's considering no-fault divorce. Now it'll be the 50th state to adopt no-fault divorce. So much for the channeling function in those 50 states. Um, but the point is that the so-called breakdown of certain aspects of marriage as doctor, as Mr. Blankenhorn admits and testifies under oath, and good for him, he did come here for cross-examination, was a product of the breakdown of heterosexual marriage. It didn't be happen because someone in the California, Supreme, the California Supreme Court decided that this is a right that cannot be withheld from individuals. And as far as raising children in a stable, happy environment, here's the last clip from Mr. Blankenhorn. You were not meaning to imply, were you, that biological parents were any better parents than adoptive parents? No, sir. In fact, the studies show that all other things being equal, Two adoptive parents raising a child from birth will do as well as two biological parents raising a child from birth, correct? No, sir, that's incorrect. No, sir. Um, May I say another word on that, please? Um, uh, you'll have an opportunity okay. on redirect. Um, it was a clarifying thing. It actually supports something you just said. The studies show that um, uh, adoptive parents, because of the rigorous screening process that uh, they undertake before becoming adoptive parents, actually on some uh, outcomes uh, outstrip the biological parents in terms of providing uh, pr a protective uh, care for their children. Well, there you have it. There's, there's 37,000 children in same-sex families in California. According to Dr. Blankenhorn, they're better off, perhaps, than in opposite-sex marriages. Now, maybe they're not. But all of the evidence was that they would not be any worse. Several of the evidence, much of the evidence, suggested those, those children um, are in happy relationships. And Doc, Mr. Blankenhorn also suggested that when marriage is legalized between their parents, they will be better off still. Now, it is important to say another word or two about procreation and whether it's a state's interest. I mentioned this before, but I want to emphasize it. If it's the state's interest in procreation that animates the right to marriage, what if the state changes its mind? There have been cultures throughout the world that have decided we've had too much procreation, we have too much population growth. What if the state of California decided 10 years from now, we don't want so many people in California? Would they be able then? I don't think anyone here would agree that, they could, that the state could then cut off the right to marriage because there's individual right of privacy, liberty, association, and that's what it is. And so the state can't put the switch on and the switch off because it's not the state's right, it's the individual's right. We mentioned the 14 Supreme Court cases None of them said, including the one that Mr. Cooper mentioned over and over again, the Maynard case, none of them said it's the state's interest in procreation. And in those cases included, where they were talking about the fundamental right to marriage, they talked about the fundamental right to marriage as an individual right in the context of contraception, which is not procreative, interracial marriage, which is neutral on the subject, divorce, which is not channeling somebody into a relationship, mandatory leave for public school teachers, family occupancy of building of a particular family home, prisoners, and so forth, abortion even, including the last case, Lawrence versus Texas, which talked about it in the context of the rights of homosexuals to seek autonomy, the same right for these decisions just as a heterosexual person may do. And Mr. Cooper, twice or three times cited Justice Stevens in, in the minority in the Bowers versus Hardwick case. It turns out that Justice Stevens, in his 
dissent in Bowers versus Hardwick is quoted in the majority decision in Lawrence versus Texas. So the same authority that Mr. Cooper was relying on says this on, on page 578 of Lawrence versus Texas. His dissent in Bowers is placed on the record and a part of the majority opinion in Lawrence. Individual decisions by married persons concerning the intimacies of their physical relationship, even when not intended to produce offspring, are a form of liberty protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Moreover, this protection extends to intimate choices by unmarried as well as married persons. That's the Oracle Justice Stevens confirming the point of all of the witnesses that talked about that. In this case, the expert witnesses, Dr. Cott, Dr. Peplau, uh, and, and so there, it, it isn't that is not the definition of the institution of marriage, and Proposition 8 isn't changing the institution of marriage. It is correcting a restriction based upon sex and sexual orientation. What ha you asked the question, I'll be brief on this, what happened in California or throughout the United States? Why have things changed with respect to, why are we all of a sudden talking about same-sex marriage? Several of our witnesses talked about the fact that the history of discrimination that no one denies has improved. It's had ameliorated. It's no longer against the law to, have, to, be, to work for the federal government. It's no longer against the law in most places to walk into a bar if you're homosexual. The breakdown, thank God, of some of these barriers has changed people's attitudes. And I'm sure that contributes to people saying now, well, if that's the case, and psychiatrists have changed their view about homosexuality, people no longer think it's a disorder or anything like that. They've explained and under, we've begun to understand the differences between of various members of society, and we've found out that all of those horrible taboos are not justified in fact, and the stories, some of which we're in the ads that we're supporting Proposition 8 are no longer true. So of course people are thinking, well, if these are our fellow citizens and they don't present a, a risk to us, they're not damaging, they are just like us, why shouldn't we start talking about marriage? You've talked a, a bit about the Loving case and the change that occurred there. 41 states, it wasn't just a southern thing, it wasn't just just in the South, it was 41 states at one point had a prohibition on interracial marriage, and the opponents of, of the change in that case said, this is going to change the traditional definition of marriage. It's going to weaken marriage, and the Supreme Court brushed that aside. But in 1967, it wasn't 41 states that no, had it, these restrictions. It, it was, was about 14 or 15, 15 in 1967. Or 15. But it had been at one point 41 states. Right. And California broke the barrier 20 years before Loving. So some 27 states uh, removed the restriction. And, and, the, and that first one, the ice was right broken here, right, right, by right. a court I decision. I fully understand, but uh, there was already a tide running, a political tide running with respect to interracial marriage. And... Uh, as Mr. Dooley commented about the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court took note of that. Now, do we have a political tide here that's going to carry the Supreme Court? I, b I believe, Your Honor, that there is a political tide running. That I think that people's eyes are being opened. People are becoming more understanding and tolerant. The polls tell us that. That isn't any secret. But that does not justify a judge in a court to say, I really need the polls to be just a few more points higher. I need someone to go out and take the temperature of the American public before I can break this barrier and break down this discrimination. Because if they change it here in the next election in California, we still have Utah, we still have Missouri, we still have Montana. This case is going to be in a court. Some judge is going to have to decide what we've asked you to decide, and, and there will never be a case with a more thorough presentation of the evidence. There will never be a case which, with such a widely, wildly crazy system that California has. There will never be a case more like Romer, where the right existed and then it was taken away. There will never be a case against the background. The Supreme Court 
really made that step that you're talking about in Lawrence versus Texas. And that overruled Bowers versus Hardwick, which was only 20 years earlier, but that broke the barrier by saying that the behavior, the conduct between the individuals is a right of privacy and it's protected by the Constitution. And the right of privacy is the same right that we're talking about in the context of marriage. And I don't think that is justification uh, for waiting any longer. And as I said, that the, the most compelling thing that I've read on that subject was the arguments that were being made to Martin Luther King saying, you know, you ought to ease up. Um, the people aren't ready for these kind of changes. There's going to be a backlash. And his letter from a Birmingham jail explaining why he could not wait to press the civil rights of his fellow citizens is as compelling um, a statement on that subject that's ever been written. Now, we talked a little bit about, oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cooper came up with something that I hadn't really heard about until the closing argument in this case. I really don't remember the evidence. The threat of irresponsible procreation. I tried to figure out what that means because the clients I represent um, don't present a threat of irresponsible procreation. They're interested in getting married to someone of the same sex. Mr. Cooper acknowledged they're not a threat of irresponsible procreation. On the other hand, heterosexual couples who practice sexual behavior outside their marriage are a big threat to irresponsible pro procreation, if that's what it's all about. So if proposition... Heterosexuals that have led to the deinstitutionalization of marriage and heterosexuals that's are That's right, people <laughs> will run out and, yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. But we don't have the proof of it, and we don't know what will happen, and the experts said that it wouldn't happen, and the experts said that marriage would be stronger. But the one thing we do know, unless you believe that, that the allowing them into the institution, you're going to have all these heterosexual people running out and engaging in extramarital conduct. Um, that is not going to happen. That is not the evidence in this case. And it, just because a lawyer says it in the here doesn't mean it's true. We have evidence. We have a three-week trial that demonstrates it. We had a short discussion about the motivations of the voters. You ask a question. Right. And was, was the procreation protection goal a part of why the voters voted for Proposition 8. Mr. Cooper cited two examples. Well, we, he cited three, the voter pamphlet, and I'm going to come back to that. He cited PX 97 and PX 27. While I was sitting here, we looked at those exhibits, and they do have to do with men and women, but they don't mention procreation. So that wasn't put before the voters in those two documents. I hope I'm not mistaken, but I'm quite certain that we looked at those and that's the answer to that. As far as the ballot, the official ballot pamphlet is concerned, here is the argument. This, I think, was Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1 in this case. And here's the, there's, there's about six paragraphs of, um, arguments about why Proposition 8 should be adopted. I just did a hurried look. I couldn't find the word procreation. I could find the words activist judges, but the words that I, <laughs> but the words that I found the most were protect our children. They're in there about five or six times in those few short paragraphs. Protect our children from learning that gay marriage is okay. That is to say that gay people are okay. The, the motivation for the adoption, if there's one thing that would have more significance than anything else, all of the advertising, all the advocacy or anything, it's the argument that the proponents made and put before the voters in the hands of every single voter. I submit that that is the kind of discriminatory animus. I'm not projecting an evil motive. I'm simply saying when you're projecting on a group of people that they are different and you don't want your children to know about them. You certainly don't want your children to think they're normal. That is what animated Proposition 8 and that's the best evidence of it. Now the trial. The trial, we relied on a definition of marriage, as I pointed out, 
that was supported by 14 Supreme Court decisions. I've said them over and over again, privacy and association and liberty and that sort of thing. Mr. Cooper's been mentioning some appellate court decisions with all due respect. The 122 year history from the United States Supreme Court outweighs that. We had the evidence of the plaintiffs and some other witnesses during the trial talking about what marriage meant to them and what it meant to be denied marriage. That was pretty powerful evidence. We didn't have anything on the other side. And then we had eight witnesses who were experts, the best ones we could find in the world on history of marriage, marriage itself, the stigma caused by discrimination, uh, the emotional damage caused by discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, immutability, we had all kinds of evidence about that. I don't know how my opponent can stand up here and say that there was evidence on the other side. There wasn't evidence on the other side. He said it's a matter of choice. Well, it is not a matter of choice. It may, there may people, some people may change, but it is a sexual identity that most people have or don't have one way or the other, and the experts testified that it was an immutable characteristic and political power. Anyway, that was all of the evidence in this case, Supreme Court decisions, testimony by the people affected by Proposition 8, and eight of the leading experts in the world, and then there was Mr. Blankenhorn who really sort of came over to our side. But on the other side of that, if you discount Mr. Blankenhorn, <coughs> there was nothing. This is a trial where all of the evidence was supported on one side. With respect to immutability, um, Mr. Cooper quoted the high-tech gaze, gaze case from the Ninth Circuit. I must have heard that phrase six or eight times during his closing argument. The high-tech gaze case was in 1990, I think it was. Um, it was, it relied on Bowers versus Hardwick, which the Supreme Court specifically reversed and overruled. Bowers versus Hardwick isn't anything that you can rely on in the Ninth Circuit or anywhere else. The high-tech gaze case was superseded by Hernandez versus Montiel, which is 1999 decision. And on page 1093, I'll just read one sentence. Sexual orientation and sexual identity are immutable. They are so fundamental to one's identity that a person should not be required to abandon them. That, if we're going to have a Ninth Circuit precedent that would be guidance for your honor, that's the case. The standard of review, I think I will skip that over. I think that it's important for me to finish <coughs> to talk about what is happening here. What is happening here, and it affects the standard of review because we think it's, of course, strict scrutiny or a level of higher scrutiny. You asked Mr. Cooper the question, isn't it a gender-based distinction? And he acknowledged that it is. I mean, it, your choice of, of the, your marital partner is dependent upon their gender. A certain number of people are disqualified from your freedom of choice because of their gender. That's gender discrimination. And the choice of gender is driven by sexual orientation, so it's discrimination on that basis. And it does have to do with the fundamental, if you believe that it's a fundamental right to marriage, not a fundamental right to be married in June or a fundamental right to be married to certain types of people. If it's a fundamental right to marriage, it's strict scrutiny. But at any event, you have to have a reason. And you have to have a reason that's real, not a post hoc justification, not speculation, not built on stereotypes, and not hypothetical. That's what the Supreme Court decisions tell us. We don't have that here. We have a decision that takes, and there isn't any question, a group of people who've been victims of discrimination, who are a discrete minority, who have identifiable characteristics, their sexual orientation, and we want to foreclose them for participating in the most fundamental relationship in life. Now, rational basis, strict scrutiny, or some kind of intermediate scrutiny tells you those are basic facts. You're discriminating against a group of people, you're causing them harm, you're excluding them from an important part of life, and you have to have a good reason for that. And I submit at the end of the day, I don't know, and I don't have to put any evidence, with all due respect to Mr. Cooper, does not cut it. It does not cut it when you're taking away the constitutional rights, 
basic human rights and human decency from a large group of individuals and you don't know why they are a threat to your definition of a particular institution. The combination, as I said before, of those 14 Supreme Court decisions that tell us how valuable marriage is, the Romer case that says you can't take away rights and make them unconstitutional, to, uh, impossible to recover except by amending your state constitution. And the Lawrence case that says that the sexual orientation of individuals in their private conduct is a protected right. You cannot then, in the face of all those decisions by the United States Supreme Court, say to these individuals, we are going to take away the constitutional right to liberty, privacy, association, and sexual in intimacy that we tell you that you have, and then we will now use that as a basis for not allowing you the freedom to marry. That is not acceptable. It's not acceptable under our Constitution. And Mr. Blankenhorn is absolutely right. The day that we end that, we will be more American. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Olson. And with that, the matter will be submitted. Thank you very much, Council. I appreciate the advocacy on both sides. It's been uh, splendid. And both written advocacy, oral advocacy, and uh, the presentations that you've made. So if there is nothing further, Mr. Cooper. Oh, Your Honor, thank very you well. so much. Very well. The matter is submitted. Thank you very much.